My guest is Scott Nakagawa. He's senior partner at Change Lab, which is a grassroots institute for racial equity. He's also a longtime activist in the LGBT movements and the Fight the Right campaigns of the 1990s. And he's just started a blog, racefiles.com. Scott, it's great to have you. Let's talk about, to start, Asian American attitudes. There's a new report out from the Pew Research Center. I'll just begin by reading you the very beginning of it. Asian Americans are the highest income, best educated, and fastest growing racial group in the United States. They're more satisfied than the general public with their lives, finances, and the direction of the country. And they place more value than other Americans do on marriage, parenthood, hard work, and career success. You had a problem with that. I had a very big problem with that. You know, for one thing, the whole way in which the Asian American population is framed by the Pew Research Center's report um, lumps together a hugely diverse array of different Asian ethnic groups who come to this country for a variety of different reasons, pushed out of their countries by a variety of different forces, some attracted here by special visas offered to people who can fill high-skilled jobs or who are business investors, as if they're all one group. In fact, the Pew Center report actually calls Asian Americans a distinct group, um, made distinct by higher educational attainment, higher incomes, greater family wealth, et cetera. Um, at the same time that it does so by comparing us to the American population in general, not disaggregated by race, and um, while including in that group Taiwanese businessmen who are coming specifically as businessmen to the United States, and uh, Hmong refugees who are coming here because they're being pushed out of their own country. Now, even the Pew Research Center's researchers have a line in the report that says, Asian American is not a term that holds much sway with Asian Americans. Even they understand there's a problem mm -hmm. with this clumping together, and yet they do it. Well, imagine, you know, Asian Americans include people from Iran and people from Japan. They include people from the Philippines and people from Indonesia. You know, these are people who have no shared history and who have distinct languages and cultures, who share no common phenotype, and who've never identified as one group, as Asians. You know, the whole term Asian American is really a political a term. You know, it refers to a political identity that was adopted by Asian Americans at one time in the 60s um, who were involved in radical politics as a counter to Oriental, which is a pejorative. You know, it's a very disparaging um, way of referring to um, Asian peoples um, that is, uh, you know, rooted in a history of viewing um, Asians, of Europeans viewing Asians as these exotic others, people who to be exploited, to be studied, um, and not as real human beings, not as complex people who belong to a variety of different diverse nations. So what are the implications or the consequences of a study like this or the continued use of this term in this way? Well, I think for one thing, what it does is it constructs an idea about race that is to the detriment of Asian Americans. I think that it takes this notion of this people who come from various different ethnic groups who themselves do not identify as one race and calls us a race as if somehow that indicates something about us that is essential to us as Asian people, mm -hmm. when in fact there is no such common um, basis for identity. And it also um, has the effect of making invisible certain Asian groups, Asian ethnic groups, who are actually not successful, not highly educated, and not enjoying their lives in America in the way that, that we are purported to by the report. You know, their satisfaction rate may be quite a bit better than it was in the countries that they've left, often places that are torn by war or horrible poverty, often dri driven by U.S. policy. Um, once they get to the United States, I imagine it's a pretty good deal, right? But um, the reality is that they come for very different reasons. So in terms of racial equity, the goal of your um, project right now, and the goal of your life, so much of your work, what does that stereotyping do for racial equity progress in terms of the attitudes other groups mm -hmm. have towards Asian Americans? Well, you know, it presents Asian Americans as a kind of a model minority. I think that's a term that many people have heard. That a model minority myth is something that was created specifically as part of a backlash against the gains of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It's rooted in the 60s. And it was a creation of the media in order to present this foil to uh, African American grievances about racism, basically positing this notion that Asian Americans were doing just fine 
we were being incredibly successful. We had high levels of education, high levels of uh, financial success, and we did it. Um, we achieved those things because we were quiet and hardworking, uncomplaining, and we just pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. So if we could do it, why couldn't others? And how does it work in the current debate about immigration? Well, in the current debate about immigration, it really positions us as the good immigrants, new Asian immigrants to the United States versus bad immigrants who are coming to this country from places like Mexico and who are perceived to be stealing jobs um, and who are perceived to be um, a drain on the U.S. economy. And so it really plays, this idea, it plays with this idea of good immigrants who come the right way and who are coming into the country in order to make a contribution as opposed to those who are coming here to take something away. And I think really tends uh, to polarize that debate. Of course, we know the reality is that a significant percentage of Asians who do come into the United States come in without documents. Mm -hmm. And many, many Asian immigrants who come to the United States come here for low-wage um, jobs, just as do Mexican immigrants and many other refugees of the global economy. We come here because the countries we come from have been impoverished, often by U.S. economic policy or U.S. foreign policy, and um, you know, come in search of the only place where we can get any kind of employment at all and hope for any kind of political stability. At Change Lab, you also did your own research mm -hmm. um, into the attitudes of Asian Americans. Um, a, what term should we use instead, if that's no good? And B, what did you find? Well, I would say, first of all, in terms of terminology, Asian American is fine. After all that? After all that, as long as we're clear that when we use the term Asian American, it's a political identity, right? This is not about trying to lump together disparate people by race in order to try to arrive at some kind of median or average experience, but instead in order to understand Asian Americans in terms of how we've been cast by the you know, general public, right? To understand how we are raced in America. Mm -hmm. So um, given that, we looked at that, uh, people within that frame and specifically interviewed people who are progressive. So we didn't go after everybody. We didn't do a broad cross-section. We interviewed about 80 Asian American progressives around the country who are involved in various different kinds of struggles to achieve social equity, to gauge what their attitudes and ideas were around race, racial justice, and the challenges we face in order to achieve racial justice in the United States So today. what did you find? Well, what we found was that most people we interviewed agreed with us that race is a social construct. Um, it has very real economic and political consequences, but that in fact it is an idea that is not something that just comes up out of nature. And so that was a reassuring thing. Um, more and more we find that people believe that race is just a natural thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was good to see that activists think otherwise. And we also found that among Asian ethnic groups around the United States, there is a tremendous problem with invisibility that one of the real challenges people felt like they faced in trying to move a racial justice agenda was um, to lift up the visibility of the issues and problems being faced by Asian Americans and also to lift up the leadership of Asian Americans in racial justice in front of other groups that are struggling for similar goals. And why is that important? I think that there is a broad um, stereotype or misconception about Asian Americans being uh, not as active, not as present on issues of racial justice around the country. Um, I think that for many, it's, there's a belief that the uh, racial bribe of a sort was extended to us, that we were allowed to become honorary whites, and many of us have accepted that bribe. Um, and, you know, I don't think that it's entirely untrue. I think that, you know, Asian Americans increasingly do demonstrate that they are um, achieving certain levels of success because we came in after the civil rights movement. We benefit from many of those gains without necessarily having been present in those struggles and um, are nonetheless not faced with some of the kinds of barriers that, say, African Americans, for example, or Latinos are faced with. And so um, we end up slipping through, um, some of us. And um, depending on our cla uh, class and other kinds of factors that also provide certain advantages, the way we immigrated, some of us have managed to climb the hierarchy and appear to have uh, you know, uh, achieved a better situation than many other people of color in the country. So it's not entirely untrue to say that Asian Americans have to an extent accepted a kind of racial bribe. Mm. I think what's important to keep in mind, though, is that that term honorary whites um, is a very real one. It, it comes first with the word honorary, right? In other words, we're not really white people, but we have been given some of those privileges or some of those privileges have been extended to us if we can achieve in certain other areas. 
And um, wherever that um, privilege is extended, it can also be taken away. And we see that happening again and again throughout history, where Asian Americans are allowed to attain a certain status, but then in times of stress, in times of war, or in times of economic difficulties, particularly when there's competition with Asian countries, uh, um, that that privilege is pulled back. Are you afraid that with the fear of the growth of China as the world's most powerful economy eclipsing the United States, you'll see a, a backlash like that? Um, I imagine there will be one. I think that there is a tremendous fear of the rise of China and the rise of Asia in general. And a uh, terrible fear on the part of people that somehow if the United States is not number one, that, or that the United States is not able to dominate the global economy, that somehow it's going to cause a collapse of all of our prospects. And so I would say that that's not true on the one hand, but that that does um, drive a certain kind of fear. And the history that we've had in um, you know, how we frame these issues when they arise, I think indicates that we have a problem on our hands. Mm -hmm.